Greed Incorporated, how to set up and play. First thing you'll do is lay out the game board. You'll sort all of the good cards that correspond to the goods in the game and just lay those out at the top. You'll also put a black cube on the starting price for each of the goods that's indicated by the color spot. You'll also put a yellow cube on the market trend price for the good and all goods start at neutral. You'll put black cubes on the gold status symbol track on the yellow boxes so it starts at 50 and then you'll put black cubes on the silver status symbol track and this will start at 30. Next you'll put the gold and the silver status symbol cards on the board. They're indicated by this border. So these have the gold border and these have the silver border. You'll actually sort these in descending order. Uh, so the A card on top going down and then the same thing for the silver status symbol cards. A on top going down and just leave those on the board. Next you can put the money next to the board. You can use the paper money that comes with the game or I'm just using poker chips. I find them easier. All money and in fact all, all information in the game is public um, with the exception of some secret bidding uh, that takes place but I find that poker chips work fine. Next you'll prepare the stack of asset cards. So here's the back for the asset cards. You're first going to remove asset cards from the game if you're playing with only three or four players. So if you're playing with four players, you're going to remove these cards that say X, three, and three or four. And then there's also cards that say remove them if they're four players. So if you're playing in a four player game, you'll remove a total of eight cards. These three, three slash four and the ones that just say the slash four. If you're playing in just a three player game, you're only gonna remove these four cards from the game. If you're playing in a five player game, you use all the asset cards. So I'm setting this up for a three player game, so I'm gonna remove these four cards from the game. I'm gonna leave the four player cards in the game. And then what you do next is you sort the asset cards into four stacks. Uh, these are all the teens, these are the 20s, these are the 30s, and these are the 40s, and then you'll shuffle each stack. After you've shuffled each of the stacks, you'll just put the 40s on the bottom, the 30s on top of those, and likewise, the 20s will go on top of those, sh shuffled within their piles and then the teens on top of those, and you've created the draw deck for the asset cards. Once you've created the asset card deck, you're actually gonna deal two to each player. So I'm playing a three player game, so each player will get two asset cards, and they will get their starting stack of player markers. These, these markers go with the player. So each player will get with two asset cards and their player markers, Players start with no private cash to start the game. Any player markers that you're not using can just get removed from the game. Next, you'll prepare the company cards in the game. The ones with the black circle are the starting company cards. And the ones with the white circles are the ones that can actually get started um, after the game uh, is in process. So you'll take the ones with the black circles You'll shuffle these, and you'll randomly deal one to each player. All right, I've randomly dealt a company card to each player in this three-player game. Um, the player that actually gets the lowest number company card, which in this example is one, will actually get the starting player marker. Any company cards that aren't used, this is a three-player game, just get removed from the game. The other company cards with the white circle will actually just get placed next to the board game and these are companies that can get started throughout the game. Each player will get a company placard 
uh, for the company that they started. So you can take the company card and just put it on the company placard. They also get to put one of their player tokens on the CEO spot. So do that for each player. And then each company gets to start with a with 100 of free cash into the free cash spot. From this point forward, it's very important to keep separate companies that are controlled by players separate from the player asset cards and the player tokens. And as players get private cash, making sure that stays separate from company funds. You'll also set out additional company placards equal to the number of players. So since this is a three player game, I'm setting out three additional company placards. Basically that means that's limiting the number of new companies that can get created uh, in this game. If we were playing a five player game, obviously each player would start with a company and then we could start five new companies in a five player game. So the number of new companies that can get started are based on the number of players. You're also gonna give each company a black dollar sign. This is used to mark and kind of put on top and lock uh, last year's income that was earned. Since this is a newly formed company, we won't put that on the board and that'll help us remember that this is a newly formed company and they're not subject to the blame game um, or they're not subject to actually getting any executives fired during the blame game phase since they're a newly formed company. In later rounds, once they get a chance to earn money, we'll put that there to lock last year's earnings. The last thing we'll do as part of setup, and it's actually any time a new company is started and a company card is selected, we'll actually adjust the trend price for the good on the company card. So here you can see it's the cotton icon and it's a green arrow saying it's gonna go up one. So you go to the market trend prices for cotton and we'll adjust that to a plus one. And we'll do that for each of the company cards that got started. So we'll see houses will go up one and sand will go up one. So sand will do one and houses one. And again, we will do that every time a company card or a company is started in the game. So the game is played over a number of rounds um, based on when the final asset cards get played by players. Um, in a three player game, there's gonna be 12 rounds or 12 years. And in a four or a five player game, there's gonna be eight rounds or eight years. And the game's always gonna end in that round where all players have played their final asset card. So each round has 10 different phases. And the first phase is the announcements phase. So basically all players uh, simultaneously will select one of their two asset cards and then simultaneously reveal those and place a player marker on them. So here are the three asset cards that were simultaneously revealed by each of the players and they've put a player marker on the card. Once they reveal the card, um, what they'll do is they'll actually draw a new card in player order if you like um, and they'll draw their hand back up to two. So they'll always have two. So each round, to start the round, they'll play one and then draw back up to two. So each player will now get a card. So they have two back into their hand. The next thing we'll do is we'll actually adjust the trend prices for the goods that were on the asset cards. And these are just the asset cards that were just played. Um, it's possible that assets cards were, will persist throughout rounds, uh, but you only update the, the trend price for the cards that were just played. So what I like to do is just slide the player token down to indicate that I've updated this price. So in this case, I'm going to upgrade, update sand by one, housing by one, and land by one. So we'll come over here again, and we know land needs to go up by one. Sand needs to go up by one, and housing needs to go up by one. Um, if there are ever multiple symbols for the same good, you basically just take the net effect. So if one card says arrow, one arrow up, and another card says one arrow down, 
the net effect is zero, so you wouldn't move the trend marker. So that's phase one. Every player plays an asset card, puts their marker on it, draws a new asset card, and then we adjust the trend prices for the goods on the card. The next phase is market forces. Basically, we're going to adjust the good prices on the board based on the current market trends. So we'll just come over here, and then for each good, we know land needs to go up by one. So we simply slide this up by one. Sand is going up by two. We see that coal is staying neutral, so it's not going to move. And then you literally go down the game board for each of the goods, and then based on their current trend, update the current price for the good. Both the trend prices and the goods have hard limits. So if you ever reach the maximum or the minimum for a good, they can never go below or above those values, both for the goods price and the trend price for the good. The next phase, phase three, is the investments phase. Um, in phase one, players acted by playing asset cards. In phase three, companies are going to act. So in the game, a single player may hold uh, two companies, for example. So when we get into phase three, each company will act in phase three. And basically, a company is going to take cash from their free cash spot and potentially bid uh, for these asset cards. Uh, it's going to be a blind bid, so you're going to take the cash and put it into your hand, or if you're using the paper money, just turn it over on your board, and then simultaneously reveal your bid. So it's not a round-robin auction, it's a one-time simultaneous bid uh, for each, each company is going to make. So for example, if this player was holding two companies, they could potentially make two bids. Uh, one bid for this company and one bid for this company and then simultaneously reveal those. So each company is going to make a bid for these asset cards in phase three. It's also important to remember that only companies with less than four assets can participate. So each company placard has a spot for four asset cards. Once these are filled up, this particular company could no longer participate in the bid for new asset cards. So it's only companies that actually have a free spot for the asset card that can even place a bid. And the minimum bid during this phase is 10. So uh, you cannot bid with anything less than 10. If you bid zero, obviously you're not participating and you're making a zero bid, but the minimum bid here is 10. So once they're revealed, everyone will have their bids in front of them revealed, and then each company can take an asset card and then the selection would be in descending order from the highest bid. So whoever bid the highest could have their choice and decide to take an asset card and add it to their company placard. So let's say that this company bid 15 in their reveal, this company bid the minimum 10, and this company bid the minimum 10. If there's ever a tie, you go to see which company has the highest asset number card. The asset number card is down here on the lower left, so the higher asset would break the tie. Since we're starting the game and there are no asset cards, your company card counts as an asset. So you would use the number here. So since this player is tied with this player, since this has a four versus a three, this would break the tie since they have a higher company card. So normally you just use the asset, then the company card to break any ties during this investment phase bid. So since this bid, this player, uh, this company, technically, bid the most, they get their first selection. And let's say they really want this sand pit asset. So they literally just take the card, they get to choose first, they get it added to their board, and the player's marker gets added to their board of directors in the next highest spot. It's always top to bottom, left to right. So this player is now a part of this company. All right, this company had the next highest bid because of the tiebreaker. Now you can always choose to pass and take your bid back into your free cash. So let's say you found out you weren't that high in terms of bid order and the asset cards that were remaining on the board you weren't that interested in. You can decide to pass and just take your bid back and add it back to your free cash. So you always have that option. But let's say instead this player would like to take this card 
again, just add it to their company assets, and we add that player marker to our board of directors. All bid money just gets returned to the bank. One other important rule during this phase is if you select an asset card that has the player token that matches the company that bid for it, you have to pay double. So now this is the last card available. So now this player has a choice to make. They can take this asset card and the token matches the company with their CEO. So they would have to increase their bid. They'd have to pay double. So they'd have to put another 10 to match their original bid if they wanted to add this asset card with that player token to their company. So anytime you're taking an asset card with a player token that matches your company's CEO, you've got to pay double. So if this player with their first choice would have taken the card that they placed out there with their tie player marker, they would have had to pay double their bid. Uh, and I think their bid was 15, so they would have had another, had another 15 and paid a total of 30 to do that. If a player decides that they do want to pass and not take an asset card, again, they take their bid back and any unclaimed assets just stay out here and they will be um, just on the board for the next round. So when new asset cards get played uh, during, this, during phase one of the next round, they would get added here. Keep in mind, we've already adjusted this goods trend price. So that's why I like to put the token there. So when we play new cards, we'll only adjust the good prices for the newly played cards. But in this example, let's say, yes, this player does want to take this card. They add it. They get to add their own player marker. So now they've got the CEO and the CFO in the company. They had to double their bid. So they'll have to add an extra 10 to this bid and pay it to the bank. Now, if they didn't have the money to actually double their bid, then they're obviously forced to pass. And then we'll just give this to the bank and we're done. It's also important to remember that the bids always come from the free cash slot. Later in the game, we'll get new income that'll slide over to last year's income. That can't be used. It's only this free cash slot that can be used. The next phase is production. So the first thing we'll do is we'll reset all of our asset cards to available. Each asset card can be used once per game round. So we'll set those to available. And the next thing that happens during production is all primary uh, producers have to produce a primary good. So the difference is this is a primary producer. It just has the icon for a symbol. So this produces sand. Whereas this card is a secondary producer because it has this arrow on the card. It actually allows you to convert sand and land into a house. So during the production phase, only primary producers produce. So this card wouldn't do anything, but these cards would have to produce, and that is mandatory. It's not optional. So this player would slide this to used, and they would simply take a sand good card from the game board and add that to their company tableau. This is a secondary producer, so it's not going to produce during this phase. And this small landowner is actually going to produce land. So we'll shift that to used and we'll take a land card for this company. So that's how the production phase works. A couple small points. Uh, the good cards in the game are not limited. So if they ever run out, uh, you can just replace them with some other token or something. Also, players are never able to freely discard assets. Um, they will get discarded later in the phase if, if there's a firing during the blame game. Uh, but players are never freely just to, to dump assets to make room for other assets. After production of the primary goods, the next phase is called trade and process. And this can be done in any order. Basically, each company uh, can process goods using secondary producers. So if this company had the requisite sand and land, they could use this asset once, turn those cards back into the game, and take a house card. Or, since they don't have those cards currently, uh, they can trade and try to trade with other players. And so this can happen in any order. You can do trades and then process, or process and then do trades. Basically, pl uh, companies and basically the CEO of the company, both the CEOs of both companies involved in the trade have to agree. 
companies can trade any combination of goods cards, not assets, goods cards, and cash. So you can trade goods cards for goods cards, you can trade goods for cash, um, or you could even trade cash for cash. The minimum uh, value that has to be involved in the trade, it has to at least involve, if you're trading goods cards, one, at least one good card, and if it's involving cash of some sort, it has to at least involve uh, one dollar uh, of cash. So you could trade one dollar for a good, you could trade one dollar for a hundred dollars, um, or so forth. It's any combination. You can also trade, you know, future promises, but all promises in the game are non-binding. So let's say this player eventually wants to use this builder, so they know they need sand, and this player has sand, so they offer them, let's say they offer them, well, let's say the current price for sand on the board is 35, so that's the going rate. You're never able to buy goods from the game. You can only acquire goods through primary production or trading with other players. So let's say this player really is desperate, so they're going to offer this player 50 for that sand, and they agree. Any income gained through the trading process, it's very important, has to go to new income. Anything in new in income can no longer be used uh, during this round. Companies can only use money in the free cash slot. So they take the 50, they've earned that income this round, and this player gets the good card. Goods cards can be traded over and over and over throughout the trades phase, so they don't get locked. But any revenue gained from a trade always goes to new income, even if you're trading cash for cash. So how that work, might work later in the game is when you're controlling two companies, maybe you want to do some shady maneuvers to get cash from one company to the other. So that's where you might be trading cash. Keep in mind that any cash that gets traded as part of a transaction goes to new income and it gets locked and it can no longer be used as part of a trade. Only money in free cash can. So during this phase, as we mentioned, you're trading cash and goods and you're also, uh, you're able to process with your secondary producer. So maybe in a later round, he finally gets that land card, can use that once during the round and convert sand and land to a house like we talked about. The next phase is the sales phase. Each company may sell goods to the bank for the current price. Any revenue gain from that sale, again, would go to a company's new income. So let's say uh, this company decides, you know what, I really don't need land, so I'm gonna sell this back to the game. The current value for land is 25, so I'll get 25 from the bank, and that is revenue that goes to new income. Companies can also store goods for the next round. So remember in this example, this player is eventually going to want to use this, so they don't want to sell their sand yet uh, to the game, so they're going to decide to store it. Each company can store one good for free, but you can see the cost increases, five for a second good, 10 for a third good, and 15 for a fourth good, you ever only have a maximum of four slots to store goods. If you have goods in excess of four, or maybe you can't pay the storage costs, and that would come out of free cash during this phase, then you're forced to sell those uh, to the game, to the bank, and put that money in new income. All right, once we finish the sales phase, the next phase is to close the books. So the first thing we do is we evaluate to see if companies made more money this year than the prior year. Since this is the first round of the game, we didn't put our black token there, we know the company is not going to get evaluated. But let's say this was a future round. And let's say last year, it might look like something like this. Last year we know the company made 100, this year they only made 50. So they did not increase profits. You have to make more money. You can't even match. You have to make more money than the year before. If they didn't, they're actually going to place one of these red boot markers on their company card to symbolize that someone's going to get blamed uh, for this company's failure and uh, there's going to be some firings going on. But in this example, uh, this was the start of the game. We know mo no money was earned. Um, because it's a new, newly formed company, so this company's okay. So as long as you've made more income 
this year than you did last year, you're fine and you don't have to place a boot marker. Once each company gets evaluated to see if they get a boot marker, then we're just gonna shift the cash down. So any money in last year's income gets shifted to free cash, and now it can freely get used. And then since this is the first round of the game, any new income gets shifted to last year's income. And this is when you can mark it. So now you know, in order to avoid the boot next round, this company has to earn more than, than 50. You'll remember this company didn't earn anything because they're waiting uh, to use the secondary producer. So you'll simply put the dollar sign there to say this company earned zero uh, this year. So next year, as long as they earn one or more, they'll be, they'll be fine. And then here in this example, that company earned 25 this year. So before we go on, let's actually fast forward one round to see how this would work after the first round. So during the close the books phase, we evaluate new income to last year's income. We saw that this company did not make more this year than they did last year. So we're gonna place a red boot marker on the company. This company did fine. They made 100 and last year they made zero, so they're okay. And this company made 25, they made 25 last year, so they did not increase it. They only matched it, so they're gonna get a red boot marker also. And then once we do that, each company just shifts last year's income to free cash, new income shifts there, and they're done. And then each player would do that. This last year's income would move to free cash, and new income moves to last year. So that's how the procedure works in Close the Books. All right, so after we close the books and assign any boot markers for companies that didn't exceed last year's profits, we go to the next phase, which is the blame game. So this is only for companies with the boot marker, and we would do this in company order. So it's always the company with the highest asset number. In this case, it's uh, this company. And then each board of director member, which includes the CEO, the CFO, and the COO, gets the opportunity to blame a fellow executive. And it gets announced in this order. The CEO announces first, then the CFO, then the COO. So this CEO can blame himself, he can blame this player, or he can blame this player. Let's say in this example, they're really interested in getting an exit bonus, so they're going to blame themselves. Anytime an executive is blamed, they're fired. Now, this CFO has the opportunity to... They can also blame themselves, which would cause them to get fired, or they can blame the CEO. A role can get blamed more than once. As long as you're blamed at least once, you're going to get fired. But this player knows that, you know what? He's getting fired. He's going to leave the company. I've got a chance now to get promoted and take over this company. So this player is just going to also blame the CEO. So they stay fired. And then if there was a COO, they would get the opportunity to blame one of these three roles, including themselves. After executives have been blamed and fired, they're going to earn an exit bonus if they're fired and leaving the company. Um, if the CEO gets fired, they get 40% of the current free cash. The CFO gets 20% of the free cash. And the COO also gets 20% of the free cash. So in this example, we only have the CEO exiting. So we'll take 40% uh, of the free cash, always rounded down, pay them from the free cash, and then that money goes to the player's uh, private reserves, not to be confused with a company's reserved. So any, any exit bonus payments always goes to the player. If we did have the example where both executives got fired, we would do the calculation once. We don't pay and then recalculate. We would calculate what's the 40% payout for the CEO and then what's the 20% payout of the existing free cash for either of these roles and those would get paid out to those executives to their private reserves and they would get fired from the company. But in this example, only the CEO got fired, got the 40% payout, and this executive stayed in the company. It's also important to remember, we know this company doesn't have a boot, so they're not going through the blame game. 
But look, they've got their same player marker. So let's say, let's say they even had all three and they all blamed each other and they all three got fired. The same player would earn 40%, 20%, 20%. So a total of 80% of the free cash they would get into their private reserve because they controlled all the executives and they all got fired in that example. Any remaining free cash after pay, paying the exit bonuses just stays within the free cash of the company and then you're going to promote remaining executives. So this player got their exit payment uh, and we promote up. You always go top down, left to right, you fill all vacant spots with any executives. So all remaining executives get promoted up into the company. Now we also have a situation now where this company is no longer controlled by this player. It's controlled by the tie player. So this entire company placard now would get shifted over to this player and now they're in control of two different companies since they're the CEO. The final phase of the, the final step of the blame phase is the CEO of any company with a boot has to discard one company asset. It's their choice. So if there were multiple here, they could choose which asset to discard. In this case, they only have one. So it gets discarded and it gets put in a special discard pile, uh, not to be confused with assets that may have stayed on the, uh, the bidding board. This is a special asset uh, that goes into a discard pile that can actually be selected later if a new company gets formed. It's also important to realize that the CEO makes that decision. So it could be the same CEO um, if they weren't fired, or it could be a new CEO. But any company that had the boot marker, the remaining CEO or whoever is currently the CEO has to make the decision of which asset to discard. Uh, any company that didn't have the boot marker obviously does not have to discard anything. One final point, uh, if there are no remaining executives in the company, um, then the company is completely liquidated. So any goods cards just get returned to the bank, any cash gets returned to the bank, and the company placard is completely out of the game, it, and along with the company card. It's no longer eligible to be restarted. So once we complete the blame game for each company with a boot and go through those steps, we go to phase nine, which is work hard, play hard, where now players with any free cash that they have earned through exit bonuses have the chance to get gold status card symbols or silver status card symbols. So we're gonna completely skip this phase if no players, individual players, have sufficient private cash. So keep that in mind for the first maybe one or two, definitely the first round, but for the first couple of rounds of the game, until players get any private cash, uh, we're not even gonna participate in this round. But what would happen is if we do have at least one player with enough private cash to bid, we're well, going to do a player auction. And we're going to start with the gold status card. And we always start with the current start player that has the green dollar sign. So they can make a bid for this gold status card. The minimum bid is always indicated on this gold status track. So to start the game, the minimum bid is always 50 and then we do a round robin auction in clockwise, starting with the start player and then clockwise from them. And then the minimum increase is always 10. And literally go ahead as the bid increases around the table, keep increasing it on this track. So each player has the option to at least increase it by a minimum of 10 or they can pass. If they pass, they're out of the auction completely. They can't rejoin. And once all players have passed except one, that player uh, is the winner, winner of the gold status card. That money needs to get paid from their private cash to the bank, and then they get to take this card, and these represent victory points at the end of the game. This is seven victory points, and you'll remember at the start of the game, we sorted these, so these are gonna increase in value throughout the game. If somebody actually wins a gold status card, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to first leave the winning amount the way it is. The next time we have an auction, this is now the minimum bid. So it always ever only increases, it never decreases. So as these auction for higher and higher amounts, that's always the starting minimum bid for the next auction. We're also going to adjust the trend price 
for the good symbol that's on the status card that was just taken. So here we're going to adjust sand down by one on the status track or the market trend track. Also, we're going to pass the first player marker. So the first player marker will pass to the left of the player that just won this gold status card. So let's play let's say this player was first player, but this player won the gold status card because they had some private cash. So the start player will pass to their left, basically making them the last player um, for the next round because they won the gold status card. If nobody wins the gold status card, maybe maybe nobody had enough money to even meet the minimum bid, so nobody won the gold status card. So it, it would stay there. First player would not change hands. First player would stay the same. But we will go and actually auction for the silver card. We're going to repeat the same process for the silver auction. The minimum bid has to be there. It's going to start with the start player. So it may be a new start player. If somebody took the gold status card and the, the start player changed hands, that player is going to start the bid for the silver status card. An important thing to keep in mind is if a player won the gold card that round, they're not eligible to participate in the auction for the silver. So if you win the gold, you can't also win the silver. You can't even bid. The same procedure applies. You do a round robin auction, starting with the start player and then going clockwise. Each bid has to at least be a minimum of a 10 increment. If you want to raise it higher, you can. Uh, at the end of the auction, this track will stay locked. This will be the minimum bid for subsequent rounds. Uh, the player would take the silver status symbol card into their hand, which gives them victory points at the end of the game. Again, this is public. All players can see this. And then, like before, you'll adjust the market trend track for that specific good. And then finally, the start player is not affected by the silver auction. It's only affected if somebody wins the gold auction. After we complete phase nine, the work hard, play hard, which are the auctions for these cards, we go to the final phase of the round, which is the entrepreneur's phase, where we can, players can bid for, to create one new company in this round. And now keep in mind, it's only for players with less than two companies. So once you have two companies, you're no longer eligible to bid to create a new company. Now, there is a way to actually get more than two companies. If you actually inherited a company because of some firings, then this company placard would go over here, even if you already had two companies. So you could potentially have three companies, but you're not able to bid for a new company unless you have less than two. Also, you have to have enough um, private cash to participate in the auction. So the minimum bid for a new company is 50. So if no players have sufficient private cash of 50, then again, you're going to skip this phase entirely. Also, you would skip this phase if you've already started the maximum number of new companies in a game. Remember that equal the player number. So let's say in this game, three new companies had already been started throughout the game, then you would skip this phase entirely. The auction works much the same as it does for the, uh, the gold and silver cards. It's going to be a round robin auction, starting with the current start player and going clockwise. The minimum bid for a new company is always 50, and the minimum raise is at least one. So players can raise the current bid by one, or they can pass. If they pass, they drop out. Uh, the remaining player would win the new company. They would pay money from their private cash to the bank, and they would take a new company placard and put it in front of them, and then they can decide which of the new companies, new company cards they'd like to create. Uh, factoring into the decision might be the number of the card or the type of good where they'd like to affect the market trend. You'll remember whenever we create a new company, whether in setup or in this phase of the game, and let's say this company gets selected, we would adjust, in this example, railroads, on the market trend track. And then just like in setup, if you win the auction, you get to place the company placard in front of you. 
you get to place your token in the CEO spot. You'll put this whole placard in front of you and you get to add 100 to the free cash of the company and that comes from the bank. One final step uh, you'll get to do for this new company since you're the CEO is you can select up to four assets from the discarded assets pile and add them for free to your company. And they're not gonna come with any executives. They're not gonna adjust any prices. Um, there's only one in the pile right now, so you can choose to take it and add it to your company. But if there were multiple cards in the discarded asset pile, the winner of the new company can choose um, up to four of those if, they choose, if they'd like to and add them immediately to their company placard. And then also keep in mind, uh, during this phase, only one new company can get, can get created per round. So once that new company is auctioned and won and created, uh, we end the phase. Once we complete phase 10, we repeat uh, the round, starting with phase 1 again, which is the announcement phase, where players will get to play a card and draw a card, and we repeat all the phases um, within the round. And a reminder, the game will end once the final asset card, asset cards have been played uh, by all the players, we will complete that round. And then the player with the most status points on the gold or the silver cards will be the winner of the game. If there's a tie, uh, whatever player has the most remaining private cash uh, for their player would break the tie. And that should be everything you need to set up and play Greed Incorporated.